Hello, everyone. I think we'll get started now. It's just about three o'clock. Welcome to um, the webinar. Um, <clears throat> we're glad you're joining us today. If you need captioning, the caption URL is in the chat box for you. This webinar is being recorded. You'll receive an email with a link to the webinar recording and the presentation materials in about a week. Um, during the last 10 minutes or so of the webinar, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask our speaker, Louis Diaz, any questions that you have. So um, if you think of questions, jot them down um, as you hear the information, and um, Louie will be able to answer your questions at the end. Um, medical librarians can receive one CE credit for attending this webinar. Um, you just need to complete an evaluation at the end. The webinar, I mean, the evaluation should pop up right at the end of the webinar, and you can complete it. The enrollment codes are listed here, or the enrollment code is listed here. I'll also put it in the chat box. I'm your webinar host, Susan Halton. I'm an education and outreach coordinator for the New England region of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. My office is located at UMass Medical School in Worcester, Mass. So um, I'd like to get an idea of um, who's here joining us today. And so during the next few slides, I'm going to be explaining the, explaining the outreach program of the NLM. And during that time, if you could introduce yourself with your name, where you're located, um, if you have seen the film Beyond the Wall, let us know and um, let us know what you hope to learn today. The, N the NLM is a physical library located on the campus of the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. It's the largest biomedical library in the world and one of the federal government's largest providers of digital content. All of the information from the National Library of Medicine is online and anyone can access that information. There's no cost to join any of our online resources, databases, tools, or websites. And the mission of the NLM is to advance the progress of medicine and improve public health by making trustworthy health and medical information accessible to everyone. NLM carries out its mission through a national network that has more than 7,500 members across the United States. This webinar is presented through the New England region, or the NER for short. There are seven other regions across the country that provide similar outreach with online health and medical information, training, and grant funding. Those who use our resources form our network. Network members come from many different backgrounds and professions. For example, those registered for this webinar today are librarians, healthcare providers, public health professionals, students, researchers, law enforcement, first responders, and even members of the general public. Anyone can join the network and receive information about the training we offer. Everything the NLM offers is free. The NNLM also provides grant funding to organizations that further the NLM mission. Over the past few years, the New England region has funded about $150,000 for substance use disorder related programs and projects in New England. And last year, 
the NNLM network provided training to about 77,000 people. NLM provides an extensive amount and a wide variety of information about how to prevent and treat substance use disorder. NLM resources don't contain any advertising. They're written by medical experts and they're updated on a regular basis and you don't need to make an account to use them. This slide shows two NLM sites that are a good place to start if you're looking for evidence-based health and medical information about addiction or substance use disorder. On the left is a picture of NLM's consumer health website called Medline Plus, and the page pictured is what you will receive if you search for opioid addiction on the home page. On the right side, is a picture of the NLM Opioid Addiction and Treatment Portal. Information in this portal is extensive and has things um, or information su such as opioid prescribing, um, information about data trends and statistics related to addiction, um, even a lot of information about recovery as well. You'll receive links to all of the resources mentioned in this webinar as part of a comprehensive resource list that will come with the recording link. If you're looking for um, some um, tools for programming related to health and wellness, we also have a graphic medicine book club um, that you can um, use as a programming tool. And you can get more information about this um, from my colleague, Sarah Levin Lederer. So I'm really pleased to have um, our speaker today, Louis Diaz. Louis is a substance use disorder counselor and a reentry specialist for the Massachusetts Middlesex County Sheriff's Office. The objective um, for today's webinar is to learn what recidivism is and why 90%, 95% of people return to drugs and alcohol after release from prison. You're going to understand the barriers individuals face when returning to the community after incarceration. And you'll also learn what jails and prisons are doing to prepare individuals for reentry into the community. All right, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Louie now to, um, to give us the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Susan. Um, hi, folks. My name is uh, Louie Diaz. I will start by saying that uh, uh, this is the first time I do a webinar and also that I am not um, an expert in uh, reentry uh, services, you know, doing this type of work, but I am a person that has many, many, many years of um, work experience and also life experience. I'm a person uh, that um, is in recovery and I'm a person also that's been um, uh, incarcerated uh, uh, 26 years ago was actually the last time I was uh, incarcerated or convicted uh, of a crime. That was uh, 26 years ago. Um, before I, I speak a little bit about um, myself and the project of film that I'm involved with and the type of work that I do, I just want to read the definition of uh, recidivism that is uh, in our slides. And uh, it, it, it goes like this. this is, uh, recidivism refers to a person's relapse into criminal behavior often after the person's person receives sanctions or undergoes intervention for a previous crime. It also says recidivism is measured by a criminal, uh, a criminal act that resulted in a rearrest, a reconviction, or return to prison with or without a new sentence during a three-year period following a person's release. Um, so I will start by saying that, um, like I said, I'm a person in, in, in long-term recovery and also a person that's been incarcerated um, 26 years ago was the last time that um, that I was convicted of a crime, and I was sentenced to a 10-year prison sentence. I went away, and um, I spent about three uh, to three and a half plus years uh, incarcerated. On the 10 years that I was sentenced, I was able to 
I was only uh, supposed to do four years on that, and I was able to bring that down with uh, good time, with good behavior, and that means participating in all types of uh, programs in prison and also keeping my, my nose clean, as we say, and uh, staying out of trouble. Um, I was able to um, be discharged from prison a little earlier. And one of the things that worked for me while I was incarcerated um, uh, or how I basically came to um, uh, getting involved in, in, uh, in recovery or, or being introduced to the recovery community was, um, you know, when I went to prison, I, I was um, uh, active in, in addiction. I was strung out on um, heroin and, and, uh, and alcohol, and I went away for, for this amount of time. And when I got to prison, I was, I was really beat. I was desperate. I was worn down, and I, I wanted to change. Um, I wasn't interested or didn't care what types of programs were available in prison. I just knew that I needed to connect with, uh, with someone or with some program or something that would help um, because um, I didn't um, uh, want to leave prison um, and, come, uh, and come back. You know, I, wanted, I didn't want to be part of that recidivism um, stats that, you know, that normally, you know, they end up going back to prison. So I got connected in prison with a very uh, uh, good group of guys um, that were uh, uh, fellas that were doing time that walked me um, through this journey. They introduced me to, um, to the recovery community. They introduced me to all types of programs uh, in the prison. And that's what, um, what basically built uh, the foundation uh, that, that, uh, that I have today. Uh, working with these guys, I was able to learn that uh, to stay out of prison, there were uh, a number of things I needed to do um, uh, once I was, uh, once I was uh, released from prison. Um, the film that I'm involved with, and I hope that everyone has had a, an opportunity to watch, uh, Beyond the Wall, um, is a, a film that highlights uh, the importance of having um, uh, mentors and people uh, there waiting for, for you upon your release from prison because uh, it is very difficult. Uh, the, you know, coming out of prison and adjusting back into society uh, with facing some of the issues that, that, that we face when we come out uh, it, it, it can be very difficult. And I'll, and I'll mention um, some, you know, going to prison and not having um, uh, substance abuse treatment in a facility. And uh, if the person has um, had an active, uh, a long run in active addiction and then goes to prison and receives nothing, when they come out, uh, if they don't have these services or somebody that can link them to these services, it's going to be very hard uh, for them. Also, individuals that have had, uh, you know, mental health uh, disorders not being able to uh, receive these services in prison and then um, you know coming out and not having them it's important to have somebody a mentor um, like myself uh, today we call them recovery co uh, recovery coaches um, re-entry specialists that are out there waiting for them to walk them through this process i've been in this field uh, doing substance abuse counseling mental health counseling and all kinds of, of work gang intervention re-entry services doing all you know, uh, reentry specialists doing all these types of services, um, uh, because you know when I got out of prison, I didn't have none of this stuff. You know, I I had individuals that helped me, that walked me uh, through this process, that were able to get me connected with the substance abuse um, treatment that was that was available out there back in those days. Also, uh, connected me with with uh, with housing. Um, it's one of the the things that men. That are released from prison, um, you know, face the uh, not having uh, a housing. Uh, sometimes to get housing, um, you need, you know, um, documentation, paperwork. You need an ID, and sometimes this can be very tough. So, working in this field and working with men that are coming out of jail, uh, these are the the, uh, the obstacles or the stresses that I face on a daily basis, helping to connect these men. Um, with services and sometimes not having, um, you know, the proper uh, documentation, the proper paperwork. So a person that comes out of prison that has no ID, uh, you know, sometimes it's almost, you know, very difficult and impossible uh, to get um, uh, IDs. Like for example, going to a registry. Sometimes you know you need not sometimes I would say all the time you need like an ID to get an ID at the registry, and you need a proof of address um, if you don't have. Um, an ID, you need a, uh, 
um, a birth certificate, and then the list just goes on, social security card, and that can be very, very stressful. So, um, you know, when looking for work, um, if you don't have an ID or, um, you know, transportation, uh, dealing with the courts, uh, men that come out of court, that come out of jail, are usually, uh, a lot of them are on probation or parole. Um, they have to be in compliance with probation. They have to be in compliance with parole. And that's a big stressor. Um, so having somebody, um, a mentor, a reentry uh, specialist there, a, a recovery coach, um, is, is, is important. Um, you know, because again, going, going, coming out of prison and you're going to deal with, you're going to face uh, a lot of stresses. The courts are dealing with families, um, uh, you know, needing material things, needing clothing. Um, some men that have been incarcerated for years coming out and um, not being familiar with the, like today's technology and uh, learning to, you know, use a phone. And there's just a stigma behind, um, you know, a person, you know, uh, uh, incarceration and addiction. It can be very, very, very difficult. So one of the things that we, um, you know, did with this film, Beyond the Wall, was um, highlight that that um, that part. You know that when these men come out of prison, that's what helped me. Uh, that's what got me um, on my feet today. Twenty something years, you know, later, um, you know, I look back and uh, and I tell you know friends and people that I that I come across that I don't know where I'd be today if I hadn't had those individuals there that uh, that would that were helping me, um, that helped me you know address um, you know. So the, 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 the needs that I had um, that gave me firsthand a knowledge of, um, you know, the obstacles and the struggles that I was going to, um, you know, come across. Um, guys that taught me to uh, uh, recognize uh, those signs, uh, the signs of a relapse, the signs of, um, you know, getting, going back to my old ways, uh, to that, uh, like a crime. And, you know, they, they, showed me how to connect, connecting with the, the different resources that were in the community and also um, with the uh, different uh, individuals. Uh, an introduction to the recovery community, which was very helpful to me um, because these individuals in the recovery community introduced me uh, to the services that I needed. So, um, folks, it's, it's, you know, it, it's not easy um, coming out of prison and not having you know, the right uh, resources, um, not having, um, you know, the, the, uh, the people that can walk you uh, through this journey, uh, it's, it's very tough. So, you know, going back to, um, to my personal story, um, you know, I go away to prison and I do the three and a half years and I come out of prison and I was one of the lucky ones that had, um, you know, these individuals there that, uh, that helped me. Um, uh, working in the field, um, and especially during these times with this, this epidemic that we're facing uh, across the country, this opioid epidemic that has taken so many um, from us um, on a daily basis. There isn't a day that I don't get a call, um, a text, an email, um, you know, informing me of somebody that has um, um, passed or somebody that's, you know, on, on life support in a hospital because of, um, you know, the, the, the fentanyl epidemic that's out there, that this substance that's being, um, you know, added to the heroin and, and, the, uh, and the cocaine, and, um, and we're losing them. So it's very, um, you know, for me, it's very tough sometimes, you know, to see that um, some of these individuals, I'm sure I probably could have helped or probably could have connected um, if I had, I've had the, you know, the right, um, uh, connections or the right resources out there to connect them because it is very tough uh, coming out of prison and not having, um, you know, these things. Um, bear with me as I um, go through the slides. So how can we support individuals uh, reentering uh, the community? And uh, on the slide that I'm reading, it says you can uh, support organizations and initiatives uh, that provide uh, in-prison education and vocational training, um, 
uh, substance use disorder treatment, residential and outpatient programs, uh, and prisons and, and communities, getting involved uh, with, these, uh, with these agencies. Um, and these slides, we don't have, uh, forgot to put in there, also the, uh, the faith-based community, the churches mm -hmm. uh, that are out there that provide um, a lot of uh, help uh, to individuals. I know with my clients uh, coming out of uh, prison, I've turned to the faith-based community many, many times, and they have helped uh, with either finances or, um, you know, temporary um, housing, whether it's staying somewhere for, for a night or two till we place them in a program. Uh, I say sometimes that the faith-based community is like behind closed curtains, and sometimes they don't get the recognition, and sometimes we don't tap into that that resource, but that's a huge resource that's out there. And uh, transitional housing to get back uh, prisoners structured living environments as they re-enter, getting connected with uh, with agencies that 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 have these uh, stuff that you can provide, whether it's again finances or your time, uh, helping these programs that are going to help uh, individual individuals. Uh, um, So one one of the resources that we're highlighting here, and this this resource was in the um, discussion guide for Beyond the Wall, which I highly recommend you um, take a look at. There's there's a lot of great information in there, but you can actually click on your state um, at this link and find out um, resources for re-entry um, that's um, specific to your state here. Um, Louie, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, Lowell and Lawrence and just the different um, ways that you're connected to that community. Yeah, yeah. So uh, living here in, in what we call the Merrimack Valley in the area of Lowell and Lawrence, uh, Massachusetts, uh, there are, uh, especially in the Lowell area, we have, I call that city a city rich uh, in services because we do have um, a lot of reentry services. And I've had the privilege of um, traveling the country uh, with this film Beyond the Wall, and I've been to different states where um, they have very, very little services. So I think, um, you know, we're very blessed and fortunate to have the types of services that uh, we have here in, in Massachusetts. And especially, like I said, the, the Lowell uh, Lawrence area, we call the Merrimack Valley area. You can, an individual that comes out of jail has um, a lot of um, what we call wraparound services there. An individual can get the reentry services that um, some communities or some states uh, might not have. And again, that goes to, you know, um, connecting with individuals like myself that are, are individuals that can connect them with, with services. And then you have other, other organizations that do the type of work that I do. Like um, um, there's an organization called uh, Youth Tech, the United Teen Equality Center, Thrive uh, Communities, and, uh, and so on and so forth. It's just different agencies that are, that are out there. So in the in the area um, that um, that I live in the Merrimack Valley area, um, uh, we have these services. But I always say that I mean we can uh, we could use more. Um, you know sometimes it's very difficult to get a person into a, a halfway house um, into a sober house. Um, sometimes not because of uh, a funding or um, the 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 uh, you know they have means to get in there. But there's just no no beds available because you know the beds are all taken. So having you know needing more of these uh, programs is, is I mean we're we're always in the need of it in need of it. So this this slide actually highlights um, one of the organizations that Louis um, talked about, Thrive Communities, which is based in Lowell, and actually Louis introduced. The, NL, the NER to Thrive Communities, and they were um, grant recipients last year um, for a $10,000 um, 
um, community engagement grant, and they use that money to hire a reentry coach and also to um, purchase some software that helps them track the services um, the clients that they're seeing are getting um, so that they can be more efficient in um, linking those clients to community resources. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, Beyond the Wall and um, link it to the other two films that um, you're involved with or have been involved with. Yes, yeah, sure. So um, the film Beyond the Wall was made by a, a it's a film company out of Boston called, no, called Northern Light Production. But the filmmaker that put this project together, her name was Jenny Phillips. She actually passed away um, at July 9th of uh, 2000. 18. Uh, and so her first movie call was called Dahmer Brothers. And the second movie was Beyond the Wall that, that I'm featured in. And now uh, her foundation, Freedom Beyond Bars, is actually completing uh, her third movie that uh, uh, she had started in the prison of uh, Angola um, when she passed. So we're in the process of completing this. And this was a trilogy, a trilogy of um, a reentry um, movies and uh, Dahmer Brothers was filmed inside a, a prison in Alabama and it's about a, a meditation program that they used inside that prison and then they followed the guys that participated, the inmates that participated in this program and uh, they've seen how um, how much this program had impacted their lives and they didn't get in trouble and they're just their behavior just changed. And then Beyond the Wall is a film that follows five individuals that come out of prison, and um, I'm, I'm their go-to person, what they call their navigator, that walks them through the process. They follow us around for close to five years, and the film uh, that came out in 2016 and has blown up like across the country as a, a national re-entry film. And, um, and then, again, this, this last film that we're working on, um, we don't have a name yet, but it's being filmed in Angola, and it's about um, some guys that uh, are being mentored in the prison and then come out uh, into the community, and then they start mentoring others. Somewhat um, like Beyond the Wall, but it's a very interesting um, set of uh, films that um, you can probably find on the um, uh, Beyond the Wall um, uh, website or on the Dahmer Brothers uh, website. And you know what, I'm actually going to put the link to Beyond the Wall in the chat box. And um, you can actually go to this link and watch the movie now, the, um, the website. Um, so the link, yeah, it's on uh, uh, PBS. The uh, PBS uh, picked it up. Uh, it's on, on national broadcast. So it's uh, PBS Beyond the Wall. And um, yeah, I think we you have access to it till... Um, July of this year, um, but you, you can see it on there free. And it's like I said, it's a very interesting film. Um, it has opened a lot of doors uh, uh, for me um, working, uh, you know, in this field. I, I, you know, I've got the opportunity to work uh, in, in, a, in a correctional facility. I'm a person with a criminal history and, um, you know, I'm working for, for uh, a jail uh, for the state. I'm actually the first in that county uh, to be hired, you know, to work as a as a counselor in there. So it's it's amazing, um, you know, what um, you know how your life, the direction your life can take when you have the right, you know, people there to to walk you through this process. Like again, I never thought I'd be able to be to do this type of work. So Louis, can you tell us a little bit about how you became involved with the um, Middlesex Sheriff's um, Office and how you um, Got a job with them? Yeah, yeah. So, um, like I said earlier, I've been doing this for over 20 something years, and I started off as a, a, a an outreach um, a worker in in the streets of Lawrence, and then just started doing outreach all through through uh, through the state, especially in this this part of the state. And um, I got an opportunity to work in the field um, back in uh, 1997, 98, and um, that just started opening doors. And later on, I did some volunteer work. I went into the Barica 
a house of correction to do some volunteer work and uh, probably about two years or, or a little more into volunteering um, at that facility I was uh, given a, an opportunity to uh, to work as a contractor and I did that for, for a few years and then probably about three years ago I was approached by the sheriff of the uh, of the prison, Sheriff uh, Peter Gattusian, and he offered me a position and uh, I've been working with him uh, ever since. This is a, a great, um, you know, uh, opportunity, you know, for me. It has opened so many doors and, you know, I'm very passionate. I love this type of work. I love to do, um, you know, to do this, to help people uh, because I know that, uh, you know, I, I know firsthand, I mean, if I hadn't had anyone in there in my life to help me, I'd probably be dead today. And, um, you know, so that's why I do what I do. And um, one of the things we said in our objectives, um, we would talk about are um, what jails are doing today to, um, to help um, ready um, people to reenter the community. Yes, so um, one, of, one of the things that I'm most, um, you know, uh, blessed uh, with is that I do work in a facility that has become a uh, a national model. Uh, the Borrego House of Correction has become a program, a, a facility that uh, other uh, uh, correctional facilities across the country um, are looking at because of all the stuff that we have. So this facility, I wouldn't say all facilities, but our facility here in Massachusetts at the Middlesex County uh, Sheriff's Office, we do have and a lot, a lot of programming going on. We have a uh, packed unit. Um, it's a unit for uh, the younger, um, uh, uh, younger population. We have a what they call a, a, a Humvee unit, a veterans unit. We have um, uh, two different units that provide treatment for the for the men that are sentenced, and we also have a pretrial for guys, individuals that are waiting um, sentencing or awaiting bail and stuff we start providing treatment for them there. As of September 1st of, uh, of last year, we started our, our medication-assisted treatment. So we had uh, uh, been um, providing the Vivitrol uh, for opiate uh, addiction. We, had, we were providing that for years. And now as of September 1st, we started providing um, methadone and also Suboxone at our facility. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on. Our sheriff is one of the most progressive sheriffs uh, in Massachusetts and maybe across the country, very, very uh, progressive, very involved, believes in programming, believes in change. And uh, so, yeah, our facility is, is an amazing, um, uh, we have guys that come to our facility, believe it or not, who thank us, say like, we, we like thank God that I ended up in this facility because we do have, this facility has, um, it has treatment with, and, and some other facilities don't, and that's, that's sad. And can you talk about the, the picture that's in this slide actually comes from the film? Yes, yes. So Billy Cabrera, Billy Cabrera is the uh, owner um, of the barbershop in that you'll see in the film called Billy's Barbershop. And this isn't just your average uh, or, you know, typical barbershop. This is a barbershop that you'll see in the film that uh, has a, um, I call it the oasis in the desert. It has a, a program inside the, inside the facility, inside the, the barbershop. It has a back room that he calls the, uh, the uh, reclamation center. And this is a, a program that he put together um, that has resources for individuals that come out of um, a jail and also that are in the community struggling with addiction can come into this, this barbershop, get a haircut, and also um, uh, receive uh, uh, different types of uh, information that can help them, that can link link them to uh, to services in the community. So it's a very unique barbershop. Mostly, I would say, uh, all the barbers in this barbershop are in recovery. It's a very different, it's a clean um, barbershop. And when I mean clean, I mean, you know, uh, some barbershops, um, a lot of stuff happens in barbershops, they put it that way. And not, you know, this, this barbershop is just different. It's clean and the guys that are uh, there to help there's all, every one of them, I think is a certified recovery coach. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's a barbershop that uh, you need to visit. Oh, that's great. Um, one of the earlier slides that we um, passed by um, talks about how 
um, a large population of inmates actually have been incarcerated for um, substance use disorder. And um, what do you do within the jail to, um, to provide support for um, those who are challenged? Yeah, so individuals that are incarcerated at our facility, and I'm hoping that um, most facilities are doing this now, uh, you know, in the units and every uh, um, unit in the jail, they'll have uh, case managers, uh, case workers, uh, clinicians that will work uh, with these individuals. And upon, you know, them being released from jail, uh, they will um, connect them with a, a clinic, a doctor, um, some mental health services in the community um, so that they can uh, receive uh, services. Because unfortunately, a lot of the individuals that come into our facilities sometimes are individuals that are there because of that, they, the lack of um, mental health um, uh, treatment, and a lot of them will self-medicate, you know, with alcohol and drugs and, and commit crime, and this is, um, you know, a big thing in, in our facilities, I think, all across the country. But again, going back to our facility, we're lucky that we do have um, uh, staff there that uh, will connect them with these services once they're out. Well, that's great. And can you speak a little bit about the prevalence of drugs in the prison? Um, yeah, so there are, um, I mean, you can get um, uh, drugs mm -hmm. into facilities. Uh, believe it or not, there are uh, suboxone, which is used, um, you know, to treat opioid addiction. It's probably one of the most, or the most, um, abused drug in prisons all across the country. And also that synthetic um, marijuana there, the uh, K2, um, is uh, very, very uh, big in, in the prison. So like I said earlier, because of this film, I've been able to travel the country and visit different facilities. And um, that's always kind of the, um, the uh, you know, what I hear from different uh, uh, sheriffs, from different wardens that their uh, jails, their institutions struggle, um, you know, preventing from this stuff from coming in. But, you know, you, you can get drugs and, mm -hmm. and facilities, and um, it, it's, you know, very hard to, to figure out, you know, how it's coming in. But, but yeah, it's in there. It's, you know, it does come in. Um, one of the things that I've wondered about, um, wait a minute, it's, um, is there any data um, for your facility as far as recidivism? I'm trying to find the right slide. Um, I know that the rate of recidivism for, um, you know, people um, with substance use disorder is is high. And, you know, just based on the fact that you have services that other jails don't or jails or prisons don't have, um, do you guys have, have you seen results? Yeah, there is. I mean, I I can't. I couldn't tell you right off the right. top of my head. I don't. I don't um, um, look into this um, as often. I'm that uh, what I call what people. I'm the boots on the ground person. So mm -hmm. this stuff that uh, the the data collecting that we do at our facility, I rarely look at. But uh, yeah, we do have it. I mean, it's 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 important. I mean, uh, that's uh, most um, prisons and and programs. You know, get their funding by having you know, these, uh, these stats and, and the data. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we have it at our facility. That's very important. So I, I'm thinking maybe we could just open this up um, for questions. So if, um, if you have questions for Louie, would you um, please put them in the chat box and we'll, we'll open it up um, to see what you would like to know. Age of oh, I'll ask that question afterwards. 
Okay, so we have a question from Cecilia. Have there been any programs in the prisons that have successfully implemented restorative justice programs with substance use, substance abuse recovery services? Yeah, so I, I couldn't off the top of my head mention um, any facility that, uh, that is doing that, although I do um, visit uh, facilities here in Massachusetts that have restorative justice programs going on. Um, I'm not even sure what they're doing at our facility, but I, I do know that there is, um, uh, this is something big, restorative justice in the prison system right now. It's something that I, I constantly hear just about at every facility that I visit. What does restorative justice mean? What's, um, all right, we're getting a lot of questions here. So, um, are the educational programs in Lowell in person or do the inmates have access to tablets, computers um, with educational content? Yeah, I don't think um, uh, the, our facility does have um, uh, tablets and stuff, but they're not tablets that can connect to uh, programs uh, in the community and, and tap into that kind of stuff. It's just inner, uh, Program, you know, the programs that are in these these tablets that the guys use in, in the facility. The case managers and the, you know, the uh, um, clinicians and, and, and these units are the ones that, that connect them with the services that are out there. Um, any kind of list or site to be alerted to news about the new movie? Um, would that be the, the company? Um, What's the question again? I think they want to know, um, is there any information um, where they could get news about the new movie? Yes, yeah, so no, so at at this point right now, I believe if you go on um, the Northern Light Productions out of, uh, of Boston, I don't, I don't even think we have it on here, but Northern Light um, Productions and also the, um, the Beyond the Wall uh, website, which is, beyondthewallfilm.com, uh, beyondthewallfilm.com. Uh, I'm sure that you can get, um, uh, you know, some information in there, uh, the progress of this of this project. But um, I'm not sure exactly if there's anything and uh, and any other, you know, website. Would prison libraries be eligible for NNLM grants? Um, yes, they would. Um, actually, um, you know, um, also one of the stipulations for NNLM grants is to contain um, one of our resources um, as part of the grant um, project or program but I would think it would be um, of interest for um, those in prison, you know, just to be able to know how to find trustworthy health and medical information. And um, yes, a prison library would definitely be eligible for um, the grants that we give out. Um, <clears throat> do you know of any facilities that provide um, MAT treatment um, for inmates, so. Yeah, so uh, again, going back to the facility that I work, we are actually um, uh, one of, I believe, seven uh, different facilities here in Massachusetts, uh, sheriff's departments that have um, uh, started uh, providing MAT. So um, here in Massachusetts, uh, again, the, the uh, Middlesex Sheriff's Office is like the leading, I believe, agency in doing that, the MAT. And I think, right, all of the county prisons? Not all, not, not all, all, not all. all. No, I believe there's, uh, I think about seven, maybe more, uh, but not, not, not all, not all. All right. Um, this is another question. I used to be part of a restorative justice group that was working to get an amendment passed in the state legislature. The movie Fatal Peril really showed well what a restorative um, justice justice program is and how it works. Um, you know what, I haven't seen that. Yeah. That, yeah.
are books of any interest to roommates? I mean, to roommates, to inmates. <laughs> Do, in your experience, mm -hmm. are they interested in um, reading or? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, if you can get books into um, any facility and books that, you know, that um, like autobiographies, I know that biographies guys in, in prison love to, to read those stories, you know, the uh, uh, stories of people that have, you know, changed their life around and, mm -hmm. and made an impact in communities. You know, there was a book I, I remember um, that people used to talk about. Um, it was like a Daryl Strawberry, the former baseball player, mm -hmm. um, books on, um, you know, uh, uh, what's the other, there's a person that started programs uh, across the country, like um, rehab, and, and yeah, there, there is, there is all kinds of um, interest in those types of books. Um, so we have a couple more questions here. What is the biggest issue you would say people experience when they're released? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, uh, housing is one. Um, I face that on a daily basis with, with my clients, uh, the guys that are coming out that housing, you know, some of these guys go to jail and they basically lose everything. Um, they lose their families. Uh, um, if they, you know, had an apartment, they're going to, you know, they'll end up losing the apartment. Um, and so housing is a, is a big one. Um, the uh, connecting to, uh, to treatment services, uh, you know, they'll go to jail and get clean and then uh, come out sometimes and think they're, they're cured and they don't need any, any treatment. And so it's a big, a, a, a big issue, a, a, a stressor to me anyway, uh, trying to make them realize that, you know, just because you're, you're, you're incarcerated, you've been incarcerated for a while, um, you know, that you're no longer a person that struggles with these things. And, and you know, you need, we need to show them that and connect them with, uh, with the right, um, you know, um, treatment services. So treatment, housing, uh, employment is a biggie, having a criminal uh, record. Uh, you know, your license is suspended or you lost your license and now, you know, you don't have transportation to get to a job. It's, you know, it's a combination of, uh, of a lot of things. Um, so one of the questions was sent to me privately as the host here, but have any facilities you've worked with partnered with local public libraries to assist um, with restorative or other programs? and. You know, I do have to say, as I've been doing these webinars, we had a webinar about drug courts. Um, there were similar questions from librarians who attended um, the webinar about making connections with um, the public library and um, county jails or even, um, you know, courthouses or um, law enforcement and I I honestly haven't um, encountered that but I think that would be a really good connection for us to to make um, you know especially since um, such a large percentage of those who are incarcerated have substance use disorder and other mental health conditions and frequently, the population is pretty young mm -hmm. as well. So, I mean, yes, hopefully webinars like this will start to open up um, that discussion between between us. Yeah, that would be good. Um, so let me just see if there are other questions here. Louie, can you talk about? I, I don't see I don't see other questions um, here. But one of the things um, about the movie is that it follows five um, people who have been released from prison. And um, how are those people doing now? You know, the the movie it hasn't been that long since it it was made. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I so all the characters in the film, besides you know one that uh, 
ended up uh, passing away. Uh, the, the rest of the characters are doing very, very well. Uh, there's one, actually one of the central characters of the film, um, is now a, a minister, and he runs uh, a program in the city of um, uh, Havel, in Havel, Massachusetts, called Leaving the Streets, and he's very, very uh, connected um, in that community, helping uh, individuals um, that are coming out of jail, guys that are struggling, uh, you know, on the streets, active of addiction with the homeless. He works with teens. He's doing a lot of great work. Um, one of uh, the other characters has uh, got his, his own business, and, and he's doing very, very well. Uh, one is in a treatment um, uh, program. Um, he has had some slips and uh, has used, and he's back in, in treatment, doing pretty well. He's uh, actually working um, at, at this facility that he's at. He can go out and, and work on, on the side, so he's working and, and receiving treatment at the same time. So just about every character in the film is doing okay. They haven't, uh, none of them actually have gotten arrested and gone back to back to jail. And I think again it goes back to um, having that that mentor there every time that they have um, uh, a struggle um, that they're facing a little diffi difficulty, they'll pick up the phone and call, and um, you know I'm able to to connect with them and, and help them. And that's what this movie is all about. And Louie, how many other people like yourself um, are employed by the sheriff's office? Are there other people like you? I'm, there are other, other individuals like me that do this type of work. I mean, I don't know how many are working for, um, uh, you know, corrections or departments of, uh, or houses of correction. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, but, but, you know, there are people like me in the community helping. I give them back what was really uh, given uh, to us. I mean, uh, when I I got clean, that's one of the things that I wanted to I wanted to do. I wanted to give back. And coming from a home where um, you know I came from a very um, a, a Christian home, my father was a, a minister, and that's all I grew up seeing was uh, you know a man that served uh, the, his community. So I quickly got involved with that. And there are again individuals like me out there that do this type of work, whether, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how many are working in correctional facilities, um, but there are, there are individuals out there. Because it would seem to make sense, um, you know, because you have that lived experience, you, you know what people, what people need. And so another question we have here is, how can communities help an inmate um, in the reentry process? Right. Yeah. So, you know, getting getting educated, getting familiar with what we're talking about here today with the struggles that they that they that they face. So that, you know, when an individual comes out, you can help them. Um, getting connected with with these programs that help these guys and, and you know, encouraging, motivating the the, the inmate, the, the the returning citizen that's coming back and connecting them. There's a lot of ways that you can help them. Um, Thrive Community does a great job, these circles of uh, support that they have. Uh, that they, you know, take on, you know, these commitments for about a year or so and help, um, you know, the, the guys with services in the community. So Thrive Communities is a um, nonprofit that um, here in Lowell, Massachusetts. And um, when you say circles of support, what what are what are those? So they, they meet on a, on a weekly basis, and there are these are volunteers from the community that want to support the returning citizen, the individual that's gotten out of jail that needs uh, um, support. That needs, um, you know, for example, a per, you know person comes out of jail doesn't have a, a right to get to his appoint a right to get to his appointments, um, and needs uh, you know to get again going back to the ID thing, getting IDs. So these individuals will drive them, will support them, will walk, walk them through this process. So Thrive Community is a, a great organization that helps individuals that, 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 that struggle, you know, upon their, their release. I know that Thrive is a fairly new organization, and, um, you know, I, I know that um, their thoughts for the future are, you know, trying to um, give other um, other um, states or um, cities, the model that they're using um, once they
they have their um, finalized. Yeah, they, you know, they, yeah they're training. Um, so the, the individuals that are supporting uh, uh, these guys, uh, the returning citizens, they're also training training them to uh, to train others so that they continue to do this and do it in different communities. So it started in, in the uh, area of Lowell. Now I believe they're down in Lawrence, and, and I believe it's trying to start up here in, in the Whistler area. But yeah, yeah. One of the um, stories you were telling me as we were um, preparing for um, this webinar was about going out to Alaska. I, I had wondered how other states are doing compared to Massachusetts in the resources and I think people might be interested in hearing you know a little bit about yeah so visiting um, Anchorage Alaska I went to the Anchorage uh, State Prison I visited that prison and I and I visited the uh, the city of, of Anchorage um, I was blown away by um, the, the they have a lot of services up there and now they they got me uh, they brought me up there and we did a screening of the film and they wanted to, you know, uh, um, ask me questions about the, the, the work that we were doing down here because um, they thought they were behind um, with with the uh, stuff that they provided up there. And they really weren't. And there was a lot of services, a lot of services for the homeless, um, a lot of services for guys that came out of prison. They don't need, they had the, uh, the drug court, alcohol courts, uh, veterans courts, uh, mental health courts. You know, we're hearing about that down here, but, you know, I heard that a few years ago up in, in, in Anchorage. Um, so they have a lot of services. And, again, travel in the country. I mean, every dif every state is different. Um, you know, every state has uh, uh, different things from, from like, from Massachusetts. Um, recovery uh, courts, not everybody has them. Um, mental health court, veterans courts, um, officers of community correction. Um, you know, different halfway houses. Uh, yeah, it's just different stuff in different parts of the country. Well, you know, different parts of the country also deal with different issues. You know, we have in the, the East Coast, we deal a lot with the opiates. And uh, down on the West Coast, they deal a lot with the crystal meth. So it's like, it's, it's different and, you know, uh, different drugs, different treatments. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to mention is um, you spend a lot of time um, going out and speaking, um, especially um, having the film with you. People watch the film and um, then you sort of facilitate a discussion. And one of the um, grants that um, the New England region um, gave was for MCPHS University to have their pharmacy and nursing students actually watch the film and um, you go out and speak. Um, so just know that, um, you know, if there are any other um, people from other regions out there, that was one of the grants that the New England region funded. Um, and it's something that I do on a regular basis. I mean, I travel the country uh, doing these presentations. I go over uh, screenings of the film. Um, and you know, uh, doing talks and and bringing also uh, ex offenders with me, also individuals that have been exonerated. Um, you know, after doing numerous years, uh, they've been um, you know um, released, and with powerful stories, they travel with me. So, um, yeah. All right. So I don't see any more questions. So I I want to thank Louis for. Um, you know, sharing his experience and um, his story with us. And um, I'm going to put the um, evaluation link in the chat box. And even if you aren't receiving um, continuing, continuing ed credit, we really would love to hear um, any feedback you have um, about this webinar, about future webinars you'd like to to see. Um, and actually, the link should pop up as soon as you exit the webinar, but here's the link in the enrollment code. Hold on. So 
the enrollment code is really the important thing. There we go. Oh, look at that. It's on uh, this side. <laughs> anyway, all right. Thank you, everyone. It's 4 o'clock, and uh, we're going to end now. Thank you. All right. Goodbye.